Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining Commu Seattle's Community Enduring Phase Reopening What You Need to Know webinar. Today, we're going to go over the transportation landscape as it currently is today. As you all know, this has been rapidly changing. And then we'll be pivoting into some tools that you can use at your workplace today. Um, so my name is Ren. I'm going to go over a, a few housekeeping before we start setting the stage for this time. Um, so my name is Ren and I currently work with uh, small businesses, um, particularly businesses that have 100 or less employees. And I am co-hosting with Sarah, who, who typically works with CTR businesses. So this is the 100 or more employees. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that we cannot hear or see you. And if you have questions, leave it in the Q&A box. We will have our colleague, Nick Abel, um, looking at the Q&A box throughout the presentation um, so we get to answer all of your questions. Um, and then additionally, the slide and recording will be emailed out after the presentation is over, along with a bunch of links and resources for you as well. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah to set the stage. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Ren. Um, so yeah, we're gonna set off, start off today with setting the stage for transportation. Um, first, I want to acknowledge that the COVID-19 pandemic is a complex situation. Um, employers need to look out for the health and the safety of their workforce while also staying afloat as a business. Uh, I know that many of you have already gone through countless other challenges and stress. Um, so this has been a really tough one for, for many people. Um, so just keeping that in mind. But uh, as you're considering your plans, please turn to the latest guidance from public health officials, especially since the situation is constantly evolving. So we know that many of you are itching to get back into the workplace. It can be difficult to work remotely. Not everyone can work remotely. And employees have had to be furloughed, let go, reduced hours um, and other situations. But workplaces are making plans. They're setting dates and they're being optimistic about the phases of reopening. So a lot of people are thinking about what's going to happen when you are in the physical office. But a really big part of phased reopening is getting to the workplace. So the process of leaving the door of your home, traveling and arriving at the door of your work. So that's kind of the part that we're gonna focus on today. Um, so we're going to set the stage with these slides going forward, uh, giving you a realistic outlook of the transportation landscape so that you can make really informed decisions. Uh, so the transportation landscape pre-COVID pre before a lot of this happened, um, any of you listening helped your workplace complete the 2019 CTR survey. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, so here is the breakdown of how people commuted into downtown Seattle in 2019. Um, as you can see, transit typically accounts for 46% of all trips downtown, so the red uh, line there, which equates to about 135,000 trips per day. And then drive alone trips account for 26%, which is approximately 78,000 trips per day. So helpful to keep these numbers in mind. And then transit pre-COVID. If you can think back to maybe February when you might have last commuted and remember your experience getting to work on a bus or getting home on the light rail, and it often looks like this picture here. Um, before COVID, transit was often really crowded, uh, especially at the peak commuting hours. I know when I rode from Fremont into downtown on a bus, we were often packed in there like sardines some days. Um, so it is hard to imagine getting back to quite this level of capacity anytime really soon. Um, to put some numbers to it, normally buses carry a max of 65 or of 100 people. So transit currently, um, right now with current social distancing measures, buses can only carry 12 to 18 people. So that's up to an 80% reduction. King County Metro and some transit are asking that people reserve transit for essential trips only. So that means trips for work and trips for access to food, medicine, and essential needs. So we really wanna make sure that those who truly need transit can use it, that they aren't left standing at the curb, passed up by a bus at that capacity of 12 to 18 riders. Uh, it is likely that social distancing measures on transit will continue indefinitely. And in addition, there are service reductions that were recently announced, which will go into effect in September. Um, so really, if we think about that 46% from two slides ago that used to commute downtown on transit, 
and think about this reduced capacity right now, there would not be capacity to serve those riders from before. Uh, so if your workplace is asking employees to come back to work, it's very important for you to pause and consider how they will get there. Um, did they take transit before? Will they be able to get to work on transit? Um, so are they comfortable taking transit is another question. Um, and on that last question, it's likely that many people will not be comfortable, maybe getting on the bus, getting on the light rail, even taking a ferry from a health perspective. Um, but if they are being asked to come back to work, where might those people turn to? Um, that leads us to kind of another piece of the puzzle, which is driving. So we expect that people will turn to driving, not just those who used to drive to work, but many of those who previously took transit or who carpooled might change their behavior in this way. So before COVID, the parking capacity downtown was quite full. Uh, at Commute Seattle, we've already heard concerns from many companies saying, oh, we only have so many parking spaces in our building, what are we gonna do? So we're hearing it that there's likely going to be a bit of a shortage of parking spaces. But even if we were to fill every single parking space downtown, the system of roads would pretty quickly have trouble processing all those vehicles. Um, the roads would likely be congested pretty quickly, and there's a chance that your employee would just be sitting in traffic, angry and frustrated. Um, in addition, this could lead to traffic spilling onto neighboring streets, and that keeps emergency vehicles from reaching their destinations in a timely manner, so we don't want to get to a situation like that. Um, so this, these are kind of the things that you can use as talking points to get people thinking about other trip options when the time comes to go back to work. And additionally, many of your staff will be impacted by the West Seattle Bridge closure. So some figures from SDOT here, the left pie chart shows that in 2019, the peak eastbound morning commute hours, um, the car trips made up about 82% of all the trips that were crossing the Duwamish. And going forward, up to 53% of those trips will need to change to different modes. So really, we don't need to go into depth on this particular topic today, but this is an added challenge. The top of phase reopening during the pandemic. Um, one positive is we can learn from the past. Uh, with the viaduct closure, remote work actually increased by about 243%. So just kind of like a historical uh, you know, thing to go off of there. So really the takeaway here is that the transportation landscape is probably going to look different in the coming months. Uh, capacity is likely going to be lower and we really wanna help you prepare for that and provide you with any resources and knowledge. So as employee transportation quarter, uh, coordinators, ETCs, as company representatives, people on this webinar, you are in the position to bring this to your company's attention. Uh, you can use this as an opportunity to get really engaged with HR or with facilities in your building. Uh, you can influence policies and programs at your workplace. You can help your teammates find healthy solutions to get to work when the time comes to do so. And another factor is we wanna make sure that transit is available for the essential workers who rely on it. So some of your actions can help to make sure that happens. Uh, in the long run, we can curb traffic congestion, we can reduce carbon emissions, um, we can improve the experience for commuters potentially as well. Uh, so now that we've kind of set the stage with the realistic outlook of what the transportation landscape might look like, let's talk about how you can prepare for it. So we want you to have the information that you need to make informed decisions for your company, for your staff. So we wanna help you utilize things like company policies, benefits, programs, and communication in order to number one, help your workplace continue working remotely if you can do so. And then number two, encourage various commute modes and also shift trips away from some of these peak commuting hours like the seven to 9 a.m. times. Uh, so by doing this, we can hopefully save transit for those who rely on it. We can reduce employee frustration when commuters start to return to work. So now's a great time to start these conversations with HR, with your building facilities department. You could review, you can make changes to transportation policies, 
uh, educate their employees about benefits and other things like that. So um, one way to prepare for this changed transportation landscape is to continue working remotely if possible. So these are results from a survey that we sent in May. Many of you completed the survey. Um, we received about 415 responses. So thank you for uh, participating. And the question that's asked here is, from your perspective, how is remote work going for your workplace? So we found that 80% said working remotely is going well or very well, plus 17% said fair. Uh, so only 3% responded negatively to this question, which was helpful to see. Um, I think a lot of other people wanted to hear what their peers were going through as well. So we wanted to show you this one. Uh, so it's really worth it to stop and consider and ask yourself, how is it really going? Um, what is the added value of entering the office right now? And does that value exceed the added risk and the challenges of opening up your workplace? So today we're just talking about this getting to the door part, but once you enter the building, I'm sure many of you know and have been talking about it, there are another suite of risks to consider and to prepare for. So you can look at the risks and the rewards and really decide what is best for your staff and for your business. Um, but the best way to mitigate this potential capacity and shortfall on transit is to keep working remotely and improve the experience for your staff. Um, the pandemic is a really major landmark and it's already changed our behavior greatly and kind of left this window, opportunity, window of opportunity for more change. Uh, at the same time, we know that there are challenges um, we understand that working from home is hard on collaboration, it's hard on mental health and more, um, but the health and the safe, safety of your staff, um, I know is really a top priority and um, keeping, keeping them safe is the number one way to go. So we will be working on another webinar to talk about ways to improve the remote work experience. So you can keep an eye out for that. Uh, to give you an indication um, a little bit more about what your peers are considering, here are two additional questions from the survey that we put out in May. So the question on the left asks whether, or asks what your remote culture was like before the pandemic. So as you can see, many said that they never worked remotely or did once or a few times a month. And then on the right, this asks what you anticipate your remote work culture to be after the pandemic. So you can see that quite a few answers shifted to working remotely a few times a week. Um, it's also important to note that 22% were unsure at the time of the survey. And there are so many factors involved in the pandemic and in going back to work. So I think many have felt a lack of answers about the timeline and what the world might look like. So just gaining as much information as you can, um, listening in you know, on a webinar like this um, can really help you make informed decisions. So how can you encourage your company to keep working remotely? Um, you can educate your employees about the transportation landscape so that they know what to expect. Um, we work in the world of TDM and are reading about it every day, but not everyone else is. So um, cover these topics at a staff or team meeting, uh, email or post some of the information that you learned today. You can share our weekly e-blast with your staff. Those are great ways to uh, kind of spread the knowledge. And you can meet with leadership to discuss the realities of potentially returning to the office. So, if your workplace requests that employees come back to the physical workplace, do they feel comfortable doing so? Um, are some feeling pressured into coming back to work or feeling like they would be looked down upon if they choose to continue working remotely? Um, these are some questions that we're starting to hear. So consider maybe what repercussions this might have on job satisfaction, on the culture, uh, and make sure to be compassionate and just think, things, think these things through. Um, another way to encourage remote work is to Use this time to make refinements to your remote work policy, to review it, to add in what you've learned. We've got some resources here. And the best way to keep remote work going is to invest time and energy into improving the experience. So like I said, probably be announcing some future webinars on that soon. So with that, um, Ren will be walking you through several commute modes with some ideas and considerations to take into account. Thank you, thank you, Sarah, for setting up the landscape that we're in and um, the various challenges that we're facing. 
Um, and with, with having those various challenges, we are going to have to enlist quite a few different options for us to get to work or um, if we do decide home to make that as efficient and um, feel, feel more like a, a, a workplace and a collaborative space that we all miss. Um, so as Sarah already went over, transportation options will be extremely limited. Um, it, 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 we're at this point where it doesn't matter if you have a car um, or your ORCA card, it, it's going to be a challenge to get to your office. So we're really going to focus on increasing these, these modes that are circled right here. So we'll, we'll walk through each one of these modes and start looking at how we can increase them while decreasing the the capacity on um, parking and our highways and our, our our limited transportation systems at this time. So Sarah already went over a lot of the things that your employees may be experiencing that sh that will be changing their commutes. Um, just to go over them briefly, there are some routes may have been um, cut or overcrowded at this time. Um, they can be anxious to return for a variety of reasons. Um, they may not be able to secure their personal protective equipment. Um, and um, uh, uh, on another end, they, they may be ready to try something new regarding their commute. Um, there's been so much change in just these last three months that I think people are, are looking at things very differently um, and obviously looking at their health and, and their life very differently than they had in the past. Um, and then another thing that has been coming up is having additional childcare responsibilities. So when you're, when you're asking your employees to come back to work and you're looking at options for them, um, be sure to understand the whole, the whole part of the person and not just the door to door part of the person. Uh, so Sarah briefly touched on avoiding peak commutes and avoiding peak times. Um, there are a variety of ways to make this work for your workplace. Um, there are staggered shifts by having people arrive at times outside the, the morning peak hours or leave outside of the, the typical evening hours, which are around three to six. Um, in the morning, you want to avoid the hours of 6 a.m. to 9. Um, if that means you have a half day working from home and then another half in the office, that's an excellent way to start to provide that flexibility that allows people to avoid a crowded bus or a crowded highway. Um, being flexible with weekend work hours, being flexible with arrival times. Um, the, the schools in this area have already started to have groups you know, A through D last names that come in on Monday, and then the, the other end of the alphabet come on Tuesday, and things like that could be an excellent way to avoid these peak hours and to provide your, um, and to provide your employees a different way to think about how they work and to be efficient with their time. And then you still may be asking, everyone's going to try it out drive to work, um, what do I do now? Um, so there are a, are a ton of ways that you can incentivize people to choose another mode or get them to arrive in a more efficient way by carpooling with somebody in their neighborhood. Um, one thing that many parking garages have begun to do in Seattle and um, you can look at doing within your work site is to offer daily passes rather than monthly passes um, to incentivize people to maybe not drive every day of the week or not feel like they have to use up a parking pass. Um, you can also, with your staggered scheduling, do variable pricing by time of the day and make that match up by really incentivizing by affordability to come in a little bit later or a little bit earlier. Um, if somebody doesn't drive, providing cash and encouraging that um, there's also a way that we've been hearing um, that people have been sharing parking or reassigning parking if somebody's going to continue to work from home, but somebody else has to come into the office. Um, so just another way to be creative um, with the, what, what options you have with infrastructure at your office is. And then make sure to prioritize your parking for carpools and van pools. So if there is a dedicated um, spot for your carpool and van pool, that, that is an excellent incentive to take that or to utilize that service.
We are also encouraging people to find ways to incentivize active commuting. Um, that means working with your property managers to make sure showers and locker rooms remain open and bike parking is available. Um, that type of process and, and communication with your property managers is going to be critical because as we know, people are, are, are just closing showers and there isn't, there isn't much of a dialogue with why that needs to remain open and just the holistic nature of what we're experiencing right now where the highways are gonna be full if people can't take their bike into work. So um, one thing to keep in mind is that there is gonna be a lot of communication with various parts of your, of your workplace. And gear stipends and bonuses are an excellent way to incentivize employees by allowing them to make the purchases that they need for their active commute, commutes, um, targeted marketing. So you as an ETC, or if you have access to understanding if people can choose active commuting, and then working with that employee to figure out what, what are some of their barriers. Um, we at Commute Seattle can also help you with setting up a, a bike commute and giving you all the information you need to know to do that safely. Um, and then to communicate that it's not an all or nothing. If your employee, can only bike into work one day a week or part of their commute, that is an excellent way to get to work and should be encouraged. We also have a entire webinar um, dedicated to biking back to work and how to incentivize those commutes. It's an excellent webinar. It talks about um, having healthy challenges, different marketing campaigns to get your employees to work and if you want to really dive into more detail about that I'm sure you'll be inspired and have new takeaways on how to get your employees to try that out and we will send out these these slides so you'll be able to click on those links and all that um, so um, band pools um, through King County Metro have changed dramatically since um, COVID so um, they really aren't encouraging people to start a van pool program and uh, a new van pool program at this time. Um, but van pools can now only operate with two riders. Um, so it still would work with your ORCA passport program. Um, and then it's still an excellent option for your employees to get to work and to save on gas and insurance and, and also get an awesome parking spot. Um, but, but it has changed and we just want people to be aware um, that anything pre-COVID will have, you know, different policies in place and it's, it's much more difficult to start one at this time. But there are certain programs for essential workers and there are uh, um, other requirements as far as keeping your van pool safe and clean that we will have um, links to and we'll send to you after this as well. Another excellent way, um, since Vanpool isn't really available to begin a new program at right, right now, is to encourage carpooling. And to start something like this, it really is about surveying your employees, seeing who is interested in this type of program, and then um, even asking the managers to have a conversation with their teams on how to make that work. Of course, you want to check in with your employees and make sure that they, you know, even be, feel comfortable with something like this in the first place. Um, but this could be an excellent way to really create a, a kind of a quarantine um, or phase reopening community where they all carpool together, they know and have a, a trusted relationship and feel safe riding together each day. Um, this type of program can be a employer run program where you provide the mask and supplies, um, but it's really all about having that conversation um, with your employees and, um, and making sure that they are, are surveyed and understand what, what exactly it would mean for them, like who is the driver and things of this nature. Okay, so your greatest policy tools as we've, we've talked about throughout this presentation is finding a way to make working from home effective and as efficient as possible for your employees. Um, and so that coming into work is really kind of the last resort option. Um, making sure when they are coming into the office to avoid peak times, 
and then to continue to encourage active commuting at your workplace. So as has been touched upon a few times in this presentation, writing transit is, a, is quite different now. Um, like there are a, a lot of seats that cannot be used and it just is generally at a much lower capacity than normal. Um, in addition to that, our, our local agencies and our national agencies are asking everyone to wear a mask um, when they're on transit and make sure to wash your hands before and after. The CDC is constantly updating their guidelines, but these have been pretty consistent throughout this time. Um, and encouraging your employees to sign up for transit alerts is also an excellent way to keep them informed and um, make sure that you're staying informed. Um, and then as an ETC or anyone that is, is working um, in HR or with your employees, is just to make sure that you're expressing empathy and compassion to the various situations people are in and to, to really um, bring up to your management and to your leadership how critical it is to really understand what the commute landscape will look like and moving forward what phase opening will look like and, and really feel like for a lot of people um, transitioning out of work from home or, um, or even furloughed schedules. And now we're gonna go to our Q&A section. Um, and like Sarah had mentioned, we are gonna have two upcoming webinars. Um, one is on safely writing transit, and then another one will be about the telework and remote management um, workshops, or sorry, webinars. So from, from this point, I'll hand it over to Nick to go through our chat box, or sorry, Sarah, do you have something? Um, yeah, I think, uh, perfect. Thanks so much for the overview, Ben. That was great. Um, and I think, you know, just noting that you can always schedule a consultation with Commute Seattle. Um, we're going to go through some question Q&A right now. Um, some more people did ask about sending out the slides. So we'll be sending out these slides as a PDF. And there are two pages of resources after this as well, just kind of divided out between telework, parking, transit, biking, general. Um, so with some links for you as well. Um, and I did message with Julie Paoni, who is from King County Metro Vanpool, just to double check on some of the, what's happening with Vanpool right now. And she said that they can start vans and they have temporarily reduced the Vanpool to two people. So the minimum ridership is two, but they leave it up to the group or to the employer if they would like to have more participants in the Vanpool. Um, so I think that's something that you're able to decide at your workplace depending on the level of comfort of your employees um, and she said that they are starting new van pools at this time for companies um, so i think i saw one question in there about that but um yeah um, thanks for that, Sarah. Hey, everything's changing quite quickly so um that's it's always something to know um, you know it's online you can always call a lot of the resources and partners and everyone's always very willing to help so um, Nick, do you have any first questions from the Q&A box? Yeah. Um, so we had a lot of questions in regards to ORCA passport programs uh, that existing businesses have. Um, and I just want, I answered those in the, the Q&A section, but I also just wanted to address those directly to the whole audience. Um, Metro has provided uh, credits for businesses that have ORCA passport during the, um, the months that transit has been free. So that was April, May, June, and now July. Um, July, King County Metro service is free, but um, some of the other transit agencies that are a part of ORCA are charging fares. So the credit amount on ORCA Passport during that time is gonna be slightly lower than the previous months. Um, and there's a lot of questions about the renewal process and uh, what that's gonna look like and, and how they are uh, accounting for the fact that there may be a COVID um, spike in the future and there's you know businesses have a hesitancy to uh, start another annual program with that um, so what I would encourage everyone to do is reach out to their King County Metro uh, ORCA representative to discuss these things because they Metro is doing a really great job of working individually with each business to sort of identify like hey has your has your workforce um, decreased do you need to start a new contract with a lower pass count 
Um, are you transitioning fully remote? Um, so they're, they're being very flexible and working with each business on an individual basis. Um, it is important to note that everyone is receiving those credits. Um, and as far as the uh, renewal process, um, uh, I, I think that they are evaluating what the pricing model might look like going forward with the anticipation that um, there might be lower ridership for uh, extended period of time. Um, and we just had a bunch of questions uh, hop in. So uh, there are some questions about updates from Orca Business Choice. Uh, Orca Business Choice is just a monthly flexible program and it's a really great alternative for businesses that previously had had Passport but are finding that they're having much lower ridership and it's no longer cost effective. Orca, Passport, or Orca Business Choice is still operating as it previously was. Um, you have the ability to cancel cards at any given time. Um, there is no minimum number of participants that need to be included on it. You just purchase the passes for the employees that want them and put just the, the dollar amount or the monthly pass on that card on a monthly basis. So that's a really great alternative for people that maybe are, are having some hesitancy committing to an annual program. Um, those cards are currently active as long as you are still adding funds to those. It's important to mention that uh, King County Metro buses and other services are still going to be free in the month of July. So if people are primarily commuting on Metro services, they do not need to um, start adding funds onto a choice card again. Um, there's uh, quite a few questions that have popped in. Um, there are questions, uh, Sarah and Ren, about um, what the the plans for increasing bus capacity in the coming months might look like. Yeah, I know that's like feels definitely feels like one of the biggest questions that everyone's looking for. And I think I'd say that um, at this time, King County Metro is working on it and um, they we will be doing a webinar with King County Metro looking at kind of upcoming transit service. So we're planning on doing that within the next three weeks, I would say. So keep an eye out for that. You can also sign up for Metro's service updates. Um, you can either do that by route specifically. Um, you can also just sign up for some of their general newsletters. I know they sent one out last week outlining the September service changes. So all of that is available on their website. Um, I know a lot of people have questions about particular bus routes and looking, looking those up is possible as well. Um, I'm not sure if Ren or Nick, you have anything else to add to that, but essentially we're trying to keep you all up to date if we can, but I think um, a lot of what we covered today and talked about is just really being aware that it might look different and um, trying to think about some creative ways that you can prepare for that with your company. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, there was also a question, just a clarification that the King County Metro uh, water taxi service is also included in that in that free coverage. Um, that's going to be a really essential resource for um, the folks that previously might have been taking bus service or driving over the West Seattle Bridge. Um, and one thing that I also just wanted to throw in that um, is, I think is important to mention is that um, all of the services that are provided by Commute Seattle, including our, our individual specialized consultations, are completely free. Um, I think there are is some contact information on the slide that's current, currently up uh, for people that are interested in maybe learn, learning a little bit more, having a, a specialized consultation. And then I think one other thing I'd mentioned for um, those of you who are part of the CTR, the Commute Trip Reduction Program, is we did just release our updated Tableau dashboard. And so that shows all the results of your fall 2019 CTR survey, and it puts them onto a map. So this is actually a really useful tool that you can log in there with a special code just for your workplace. And then you can see by zip code where employees are coming from and also what modes they're using. Um, so that can be a pretty useful tool just to see, you know, be beforehand in the fall, how people were getting into your office. Um, it can help you identify areas where people might be able to carpool. That can help you identify people who are within maybe like a 10 mile or less radius around your workplace and um, start to work with some of those people to see if they would like to or could bike to work, scooter to work, walk to work. Um, so that Tableau tool is a really great um, 
perfect thing to use and you can reach out to us again if you need any help figuring out how to use it. So I wanted to mention that as well. <laughs> if anyone has any final questions, uh, feel free to pop them into the Q&A box. So someone asked, um, so this Tableau tool that I'm talking about, uh, how do we access that? Um, so that is if you are part of the CTR program and if you surveyed in the fall, then um, we sent an email to the representative of your company. I think it was last week or two weeks ago. Time is hard these days. Um, so if you didn't see that email or if you're looking for it for your company, um, you can reach out to info at Commute Seattle or either Ren or I and um, we'll find that for you. And there was just um, another question about the timeline for transit routes and uh, increases in capacity to a higher level. Yeah, <laughs> I know that's the one question that everyone's really hoping to get an answer mm -hmm. to. Um, but. Um, what, what I might say about that is that we are coordinating with Metro currently on a, a webinar around safety and capacity um, that the hope is we, we wanted to have a date for it, but we're not quite ready um, to settle on one. But we're, the hope is that it'll be in, in towards the end of July. Um, and that will be an opportunity where Metro can answer a lot of these questions directly around what their capacity is, plans are going to be, what route changes are going to look like, what service changes are going to look like, as well as just some, some really in-depth information around the um, safety and cleaning of their, their um, buses and water taxis. Uh, we'll be sending out some additional information um, on those and uh, we'll definitely be sending out invites to those uh, that webinar and additional webinars once we have those firmly scheduled. Mm -hmm. Yeah and one thing that we have started to send out I know that um, working from home with family or just anyone who's a caregiver of any sort um, that can be really challenging during this period of working from home. So one of the resources on this slide here is the Working Parent Support Guide and website. Uh, so this has been just a great um, resource for a lot of people. So um, that's also a good thing to note. Um, but yeah, our resource slide, we've got different, uh, different things to share around telework, around parking, transit alerts. You can sign up for different alerts for many different um, parties and then biking and some general knowledge. ACT did put together this ACT, which is the Association for Commuter Transportation, um, put together a nice PDF that's about supporting commuters returning to their work sites during COVID-19. So that breaks everything out by mode as well. So that's like a really great go-to document for suggestions around these different modes. All right. Um, and just to answer, oh, sorry about that. Just to answer a question around um, transit safety and requirements for masks on Sounder and other um, uh, forms of transit, it is a requirement. Um, although on things like the Sounder train um, and light rail, it's a little bit more difficult to in, enforce because there aren't um, people working or drivers in, in each car to enforce it. So, um, and there, hopefully there should be signage and, and um, information around social distancing and requirements to wear a mask. Great, okay. So I know we've got a couple minutes left. Um, just thank you all so much for taking the time to join us, to tune in. We really appreciate you. Um, we're always here to answer questions that you have. You can always schedule a consultation that's free for you all and um, reach out to us via email or via phone. So thank you so much for joining. Um, we may, we can hang out for a couple more minutes just in case anyone comes up with any questions. Um, but thanks so much for being here. We'll send out the recordings and the slides in the next day or two.